titled, uh, Be Not Afraid. Um, my key verse for starting this testimony is taken from Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. The temperature is warm, but is quickly nullified by a gentle breeze. I remember playing Power Rangers outside with my friends until sunset. It must have been over 14 years ago. How I missed the days of childhood. Those times were simpler back then. I grew up a Catholic and completed all my sacraments up to confirmation. I also attended Lutheran school growing up. I was always surrounded with Bible lessons about Jesus, which had intrigued me. Eventually, I grew up to view church and Bible classes as a part of daily life. Jesus became just a sacred icon rather than a personal savior. Now I'm 28 years old. While attending Queens College, I met a man named Joseph Kim who helped shape my view of an otherwise iconic version of Jesus. Through his Bible studies, I had learned that having faith in Jesus was something far more personal than I had believed. I always used to pray to Jesus when I was in need, but then I began praying for more deeper things, such as life direction and spiritual understanding of God's purpose for my life. One night, I remember praying to God for, for God for, to use my talents for me, for his purposes. Especially seeing as I was worried about my grades that semester. Then I was, as I was finishing my prayer, a shooting star streaked across the sky. I took it as a sign that God had heard my prayer and was then going to lead me throughout my life to him. Eventually, I had passed all my classes with A's. That was when I continued my college career in media to create films that would serve God's purpose. As I kept studying, as I kept studying the Bible and attending UBF services, I grew to know Jesus as more than just a religious icon. He was no longer just a God that lived in heaven and was too important to care about me, but rather loved me so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die for me. However, Jesus still had competition to deal with because I was trying to combine my faith with other ideas from my academic studies, especially those um, presented on television. And if you remember, especially with heroes such as Hercules, Kevin Sorbo, <laughs> Superman, I prefer Christopher Reeve, and so many others. The time, had, the time for me to leave Queens College um, the time came for me to leave Queens College, and I decided to attend Hofstra University's MFA program for documentary. I had a huge list of goals to accomplish before I could get a professional career in media. Those were the toughest four academic years of college I have ever done, especially seeing as my friend and Bible teacher, Joseph, had left for Korea. However, by God's grace, I had completed my studies and had accomplished more than what I had on my list of goals. I felt that I was more than ready to take on the quote unquote real world. I had overcome every obstacle and won every race to get to where I was. However, I did not realize that I was in for the toughest year and a half of my whole life. I was unemployed for a year, and every day was the same. I kept trying to prove myself to the world, but to no avail. I couldn't understand what went wrong. How could an MFA graduate not find a single job in New York? I kept asking God why I was being prevented from finding a job. I did not realize what was lying in wait for me during that time. I was introduced to a new obstacle that was actually lying dormant from childhood. Its name is Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. 
The first symptoms began when I started pulling out my sofa bed multiple times a day. Then it was putting on my shirt multiple times. And then putting on my shoes multiple times. Soon, I couldn't even leave the house. That didn't matter, because I was employed for that year. And all I had done was stay at home. I would go to bed at sunrise and wake up at sunset. However, slowly but surely, my compulsive rituals began to dominate my life. The true culmination of OCD came a week after my father had returned from a trip to New Orleans in September 2012. I remember going to the bathroom to do my business. I was done. I tried to get up, but couldn't. No, it wasn't something physical holding me back. One single thought. A thought about a car accident entered my mind. And when I tried to get up, and for the first time in all my life, I had never experienced so much fear and anxiety before. I tried to be patient, wing it out, but no matter how hard I tried or how long I waited, this fear of death would not go away. <clears throat> Eventually, I called my parents for help, but they were powerless to do anything. That's when the screaming started. I began screaming out of rage for my unemployment, rage at the fact that I only worked so hard to be passed up for job after job, rage at the struggle my parents faced in this country just to buy a home. Raised the whole world and everyone in it who knew happiness. Finally, after hours of what seemed like hell, I was able to get up from the toilet. I went to the bathroom at 7 p.m. that night and did not get off until 7 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> Eventually, I would end up sleeping in a corner of my parents' room with only my underwear on because I couldn't even put on my clothes. Every moment, I, every movement I made felt like death was stalking me. I cried out to Jesus most nights, begging him to lift this curse that I felt he placed on me. At the time, I did not know this illness was OCD. So as far as I was concerned, it was a curse of craziness from God for all of my sins and for not continuing to read his word as much as I should. Eventually, I was led to a therapist named Keith, who was able to diagnose my psychological condition as OCD. Now, that demon that cursed me finally had a name. However, he could not treat me, so he recommended that I visit Mount Sinai's OCD treatment center. I did so, and after giving an official diagnosis and put on medication, I was offered behavioral therapy. I was hesitant to accept the, the therapy, so I told my psychiatrist to give me a week to think about it. The very next weekend, my parents had convinced me to come shopping with them on Roosevelt Avenue. Surprisingly, I was actually in a good mood that day, and I decided to join them. While leaving the Indian supermarket, I was drinking some mango juice while walking with my parents. Then, out of nowhere, Something or some force opened my eyes and my mind, and for the first time ever, I had experienced true personal freedom. For a 15 to 20 minute window, I was completely free of all my rage and anxiety. This must have been a message from God to go ahead with the therapy. I visited my psychiatrist the next week, and he was surprised about how quickly my attitude had changed about the therapy. I went through a year of behavioral therapy with a student therapist whose last name, ironically, was Moses. <laughs> Each session, I confronted my anxieties about death and the rituals that I used to rely on to protect me from it. Each time I conquered a ritual, it brought me a step closer to knowing Jesus as my personal savior. Amen. Now, I am almost cured of most of and I'm working as a uh, mailroom clerk, and by God's grace, my thesis film has just won, well at the time it was four, now I actually have five awards for this film. And my job presents some new challenges, such as uh, pressure to do things quickly, 
which leaves me struggling with rage still. However, I see that this rage stems from the fear of being unemployed again. It's a vicious cycle of fear giving birth to rage and leading back to fear again. However, I have been continuing my Bible studies with Faria, and um, which has helped me to deal with both my fear and my rage. When Maria asked me to write this testimony, my biggest problem was how it ended. What lesson had I learned from my recent struggles that would bring me closer to God? While I was at the retreat that night, the night before I gave my testimony, I found my answer. I was reminded of a Bible study on Genesis chapter 15 I did with, her, with Maria. It was also one of the last Bible studies I did with Joseph before he left. I was so intrigued by the fact that God tries to alleviate Abram's fear with a promise of descendants. Abram's greatest obsession was having children, and his greatest fear was not being able to continue his lineage. However, it is how Abram responds to God that truly puzzled me. He just believed him. How did he know this being would keep his promise? The truth is, he didn't at first. It wasn't until verse 5 where God showed him the number of his descendants by looking at the stars. That's when I realized what Abram was probably thinking. If this God could create those wondrous stars in the sky, then he must be powerful enough to carry out his promises. That's when I learned that faith is a two-way street. Just like Abram, God must have a wonderful promise that my life will not be meaningless and cut short, but useful to glorify him through my talent of filming. However, just like Abram, it is up to me to have the humility to believe God's wonderful promise. And I'd just like to uh, uh, say a quick prayer to God by saying, Dear Heavenly Father, completely take down the strongholds that Satan has uh, set up in my life. Help me to hold on to spiritual freedom through the blood of your Son, Jesus. Use me, Lord, to accomplish your purpose on earth. I ask that you will always be the master of my life. And my one word is... Do not fear Abram and do not fear Jason. I and nobody else am your shield. Your reward will be very good.